Welcome to Brain and Avat. We are delighted to be rejoined by Nadine Strassen, and we're going to be talking about uh, pornography and free speech. Uh, Nadine has just produced this absolutely wonderful guide on free speech uh, and has re-released her classic book, Defending Pornography. Uh, today, I'm not joined by Jason. I'm joined by Holly Lawford-Smith, uh, one of our also favorite guests. Thank you so much, Mark and Holly. And let me show you my, this is the most recent version of my book about pornography, uh, Defending Pornography, Free Speech, Sex, and the Fight for Women's Rights. The term pornography uh, doesn't have any specific legal meaning, but I use it the way it is sometimes used, uh, which is um, the dictionary meaning refers to expression about sex, that is words or images about sex that are intended to be or have the effect of being sexually stimulating. Uh, before I say anything more, Mark let, and Holly, please let me say that when I uh, began by noting that the term pornography is sometimes used in that dictionary fashion, um, it is usually used in a derogatory sense, at least in the United States. I cannot speak for other Anglophone countries, uh, but people tend to use the word pornography for whatever subset of sexually oriented expression they consider distasteful or revolting or offensive in some way. But um, when I use the term, unless I say otherwise, I'm uh, referring just straightforwardly to expression about sex that is intended or has the effect of being sexually stimulating. So um, for better or worse, there are constant controversies about pornography in the United States, which is why I was asked to rewrite my book or reissue it for the third time. One of the recent cases that I think will make a great uh, experiment, a thought experiment, uh, involves a provost, a leading uh, academic official of a state university in Wisconsin in the middle of the United States, who, as far as I know, has a very long track record as a respected professor as well as university official. Recently, however, it came to light that one of his advocations um, was not only making videos of himself and his wife cooking uh, vegan recipes, presumably that would not have gotten him into hot water, uh, but they did so in the context of engaging in sexual conduct uh, with themselves, with each other, uh, but sometimes also with other parties, including uh, sex workers and classic pornography. And I actually consider this to be a very difficult issue. And if you uh, permit me, I will just think aloud and I would love to hear what you and Holly think about it too. I'm not sure if that's part of your, your format, but I'm sure you can open my mind about it. On the one hand, it is clear that what they were engaging in is sexual expression. Indeed, it's expression about cooking um, and uh, conversation as well as sexual intimacy. Uh, for that reason, it is protected speech and the American Association of University Professors, which has set the standard for academic freedom in the United States, which is respected by the courts, has said that when it comes to extramural speech, that is in the faculty members' non-professional capacity, not part of the research enterprise, not part of the teaching enterprise, that they should have exactly the same free speech rights as any other member of the community. You should not be forced to give up your usual, what we call a free speech rights as a citizen in your capacity as a member of our political community as the price of being hired as a faculty member or retaining your job as a faculty member. So to me, that's a very plausible argument 
that he his free speech rights were violated uh, when he loses his academic position as a result of engaging in that expression. Uh, but let me make this what to me is the strongest plausible counter argument, and that is that I think it showed very poor judgment uh, to make this video publicly available. And by the way, I should stress that as I understand it, it was an intentional act on his part to make it publicly available. To me, it would be very different if he uh, used some kind of controls to try to constrain the uh, distribution to a small set of trusted family members, friends, et cetera, people who had opted in to receive this. Um, but it, by putting it out there in public and knowing that his students could see it, his colleagues could see it, that um, parents of students at the university could see it, uh, it seems to me to be uh, recklessly uh, tampering with and endangering the reputation of the university and indeed his own reputation. I say that somewhat regretfully, Mark and Holly, because, you know, ideally people should be able to separate what he does as a hobby and what he does with his body, with his wife, with other consenting adults um, from what he does as an academic. But realistically, in the United States, there are in such, um, there's, there are so many taboos of, about sex, you know, from all across the political spectrum, from left to right, that um, you have to know that you are at least taking a huge risk that you are going to be causing problems for your university and that the university is going to come back to bite you. I think I haven't persuaded myself through the counter argument mm -hmm. um, because I guess I think you do have a right to exercise bad judgment in your private capacity in terms of the reputational interests of the university. That's something that the AAUP, the American Association of University Professors, expressly took into account when it um, created its standard many, many years ago. This goes back to the 1915 and then to 1940, uh, somewhat uh, uh, updated. But basically, um, they said that if the university can use the argument that what the professor says in his or her their private capacity damages the reputation of the university, that's an exception that swallows the rule. That's basically anything that's controversial or unpopular can be sanctioned. It becomes a tool for viewpoint discrimination, which is completely antithetical to academic freedom. So I think uh, he has a good First Amendment um, claim, but I'd love to hear what both of you think and what the strongest counter arguments you can make are. I mean, I had a similar um, reaction to your counter case, which is like somebody in that position needs to have a lot of gravitas and doing that or making that um, something that students and members of the public can see, it just opens you up to ridicule in a way that is very undermining of the gravitas of that position. So I think I was sort of thinking about it, yeah, setting aside his kind of private right to expression like if he did it under a pseudonym or say the difference between him being known to be a swinger like someone publishes a student media article about him that's based on a rumor but there's not a video that anyone can go and watch i think it's really like the yeah the video being available it's, it seems very undermining of his status and i think i i personally love a public private distinction like I think people should keep their sex stuff and their kinks and their I don't want to see my colleague's penis like I, I, I do think all that should be like separate realms from the professional or the workplace um so I yeah I, I did think it was really poor judgment and I didn't think it was obviously wrong that he was dismissed for that reason so I suppose what makes me uncomfortable about it is we try and generate a general principle where we say it's mm -hmm. okay to have this person fired and let's say the principle is it undermines their gravitas. 
Imagine that he did something else, which was that uh, he played the trombone <laughs> very badly um, and was quite excited about it and produced all these videos of it on YouTube and you can see him playing the trombone really badly. Or he was in a terrible improv, you know, outfit and they're just not very good at telling jokes and, you know, undermined his authority in some way and people didn't take him that seriously. If I, can, if I may say so, Mark, those are even... Uh, weaker in terms of the free speech, countervailing free speech concern, right? Yes. Um, in other words, we we would sort of say, well, it's not clear what value you necessarily add with your bad improv or your bad trombone playing. You know, what's interesting about this case is that it's not just a sex account. Um, you know, there's all this discussion about veganism. They interview the porn stars that they have sex with and they talk about questions around exploitation. They're also um, in their 60s. So it's a certain kind of niche in a way. I think his line is publicly has been to say, well, we're doing something different. We're not the smut that you would find elsewhere on the internet. We're, you know, celebrating a healthy marriage. Um, and so there's some political content in that. Um, I, I think it does boil down to a prudishness. Um, and I wonder why we have this special caveat for sex. So if we think there's nothing wrong with a married couple having sex, I think everyone's going to agree to that. Um, is there anything wrong with them privately recording it for their own purposes? I would think not. Uh, it is available online, but it's only really available by those who choose to see it. So they're not putting up billboards um, and forcing any of their students to watch it or the students on the campus. Um, there's a you know kind of sex-free version available on YouTube if you really want to find out about <laughs> the cooking stuff. Um, and then you've got to do a bit of work if you want to see them having sex. So it seems like it's quite opt-in. Um, and it might be that the person who opts in then feels very offended after having gone through all the you know protocols to, lo to log in and says, no, I can't take you seriously. But it seems you, like that's their fault. Do you have fault. the same <laughs> view about like women in positions of authority and OnlyFans, for example? So I think that's an interesting question. If you think about when your book is written in 95, um, really the pornography industry happens in a particular way, which is you've got, let's say, big studios um, with a bevy of paid porn stars producing stuff on a production line. And now it seems like what you have mm -hmm. is really auteurs uh, who produce pornography on their own. Um, so you don't have any of the exploitation concerns. Um, it's a sort of opt-in model. It seems like a way that people have generated a sizable income for themselves. Um, I mean, it strikes me as pretty terrible to fire someone because they're running an OnlyFans account. I also wonder if it's one of those things where it's a taboo that maybe only affects a certain generation. So that it might be very commonplace among 20 year olds to have, you know, um, some sexually uh, arousing content where they're sitting on cakes or, I don't know, have a shoe fetish thing. And, you know, that's how they make a bit of extra money and they, all their friends do it. And no one thinks anything of it. Um, it strikes me as less of a concern than, you know, you, you work for. Um, yeah, the it's production so rooms. interesting because. Uh, every rational point that all of us has made, in my view, weighs in favor of the free speech rights. And I'm sorry I interjected when you were talking, Mark, but the, the point I was going to make you then elaborated on, which is um, that there is a greater free speech heft, it seems to me, a weighing in support of the expression by this fired academic than playing the playing the tuba um and uh conversely there it, it's very very hard other than the special way that our society i say our because i'm talking about the united states i really don't know about yeah. uh, in fact for my european friends they mock the americans sexual prudery so i i've come to believe that there's something that's unique to the united states about it uh I'm an american humorist who my quote in my book quite a few years ago during one of congress's attacks on sexually explicit art uh said you know my ancestors were puritans from england who came to the united states in the 17th century hoping to find more restrictions on sexual expression than they were leaving uh, behind. So uh, other than that, I really can't think of a rational reason to distinguish it. But the, the, the separate treatment of sex it pervades not only American culture, 
but also American law. Um, the so-called obscenity exception for a certain category of sexually oriented expression is now, and for quite a few years has been, the only content-based exception to free speech that the Supreme Court tolerates. Starting in the middle of the 20th century, the Supreme Court systematically overturned all of the former exceptions to free speech protection for various kinds of previously disfavored content. You know, they didn't like the extremist message or the terrorist message or the hateful message or the commercial message. All of those distinctions are gone now. Uh, and the only restrictions that can be imposed are those that take into account not only the content of the speech, but also that it occurs in a certain context where it directly, specifically causes or threatens certain imminent serious harm. And when the Supreme Court last re-examined the obscenity exception uh, and upheld it by a five to four margin, this was back in 1973, so the court has continued to become much more speech protective since then. But back then, even four of them said there is no justification for this exception. And the five in the majority expressly recognized that there's no evidence that obscene or this subcategory of sexual expression, which is defined, by the way, as being patently offensive, as appealing to the prurient interest in sex, and lacking serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value, um, it acknowledged that the, the content could satisfy all of those content-based criteria and still cause no demonstrable harm. But the court said, we are just as we can assume that high quality literature to art has a positive impact on society, we can assume that obscenity has a negative impact on society. Uh, so that is such an outlier in the American First Amendment free speech tradition, but I think it really underscores how hard baked uh, just treating sex as completely exceptional a category unto itself is. And I'll be very curious to see um, how the courts actually rule on this case. But you've, I'm, I now have no doubts that I would happily sign a brief in support of the, uh, of the fired academic. So here's an interesting case to consider, and it is a real case. Um, so I think you'd agree that genuine child pornography is the kind of pornography that we can easily ban, that you're basically documenting the rape of a child who can't consent to sex, um, that there's harm in the production. Can I interject um, that, Mark? Because the question you is, went past that fairly quickly, and I suspect mm -hmm. that most people mm -hmm. in the audience who uh, haven't steeped themselves in the topic of pornography as much as we have might not be aware of it, because the word pornography is used both in the you know dictionary sense that that I refer to, but child pornography in American law is a constitutional law term of art. Uh, and it is not an exception to free speech protection based on disfavor of the content of the speech. I really want to underscore, uh, Mark, that the Supreme Court in upholding the power of government to punish uh, the use of children in making sexual productions has stressed and underscored that it is the abuse of that children that is the problem and not the resulting content to the extent that the Supreme Court uh, overturned a law that criminalized so-called virtual child pornography. It looked exactly the same as actual child pornography. So presumably it would have the same impact on the viewer's mind. You would have the same distaste looking at the content, but the content was not the issue. It was the production process. Well, Nadine, you uh, <laughs> foresaw exactly where I was going, <laughs> which is to withdraw that distinction between the real child pornography and the virtual. And as you say, in that Ashcroft case, 
um, where there was a ban on virtual child pornography that that was overturned. Yeah, but do you want, um, I'm so sorry. Africa, I, I'd love to oh. hear what the situation is in South Africa. But let me say, again, consistent with the point I was making earlier about how taboo sex is in our society, I really have to hand it to the Supreme Court in that case because uh, every single lower court that had ruled on that statute including many judges who otherwise had a great record on the First Amendment, managed to uphold the law. They were so squeamish about anything that's called. Now, it's true, the concept of child pornography is, I think, especially abhorrent because when you contemplate the abuse of the child. But this wasn't actual child pornography, and still the vast majority of judges managed to find a way to strike it down. I suspect the same thing might happen in the case that we were talking about earlier, that lower courts will find a way to not deem that speech protected, and it would be up to the Supreme Court to be really courageous and um, give the same protection to sexual expression as to other expression that might, um, what was that nice concept that you used, Holly, that might uh, reduce the gravitas of the professor? Yeah, so I think there's this important distinction to say between the harm done to a real child, and that's the reason to ban the real case. And it's interesting that the Supreme Court said, well, that you don't have a real child being harmed, so this material is protected. To give some sense of why so many people, so many judges were comfortable with the statute, I suppose part of it is there's a fear that someone viewing the virtual material will be inspired to go and uh, have sex with the child. That's the one view. And the other one might be that it's a symbolic attack on the innocence of childhood. What's interesting is I think that case comes out in 1996. So the kinds of examples that would have been dealt with might have been literary, so things like Lolita, um, might have been paintings. So if you think about Egon Schiele, um, he painted people who are underage um, in the nude. Or you could have had, let's say, hentai, you know, animated stuff. Now you have very sophisticated AI that can generate art that is absolutely and utterly indistinguishable um, from real photographs. Uh, so it would be possible to generate virtual child pornography that is totally indistinguishable from real child pornography. So one of the other arguments that could be raised is it then becomes very hard to prosecute the real child pornographer when you can't tell the difference between the material. The other argument is that you remove all incentives to produce real child pornography. So you could save all the children from being raped um, because there's this um, vegan way of making the chicken. You know, um, we just get the computer to do it and there's no real charm, harm you know, to, a, to a real child. Um, but I wonder how you deal with those, those other arguments about the symbolic harm to the, to the child. And I suppose those are some of the arguments that are raised about you know, violent pornography involving women, that it's, it's not just this woman who's involved, even if she's an actor or playing it up, that it's doing something well, beyond Well, first it. of all, the excellent arguments that you make, Mark, were in fact raised in the Supreme Court and in fact throughout the litigation in the Ashcroft case that we were referring to. So even though, I mean, at the time the claim was made by the government that the virtual pornography was indistinguishable. Uh, and the Supreme Court accepted that as a as a factual assertion and said, even so, that is not a justification. Uh, uh, and, and in fact, accepted the counter argument that you made that if anything, that cuts the other way because we are concerned about protecting real children. And this may be a way to do exactly that. Um, in terms of the uh, and and the uh, other argument about the potential adverse impact on viewers' reactions, right? So that's the the viewpoint based argument that some not the harm to the person involved in the production process, but the harm to the individual who views it, which might then translate into harm to society if the viewer is induced to disrespect women uh, and children and therefore to be more likely to discriminate or commit violent acts against them. That is exactly the rationale for the uh, so-called radical feminist anti-pornography law that I wrote about in Defending Pornography. 
And uh, I think very, very importantly, I wrote that book from the perspective of somebody who was and has been and is and will continue to be completely committed to women's rights and safety and dignity and equality and am concerned about measures that uh, while aiming to advance those goals actually has uh, at best uh, and not a positive impact and at worst an actual negative impact. And that was the argument. That's really the, the, the linchpin of the argument in defending pornography where I was speaking, I think this is important to say, not only for myself, but for many feminist anti-censorship liberal feminists in the United States. Um, including Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who was the founding director of the ACLU Women's Rights Project. Uh, the ACLU Women's Rights, Rights Project also took the anti-censorship uh, position, as not surprisingly did uh, many women writers and artists and academics, um, many sex workers, uh, but also many women who are devoting their lives to combating sexual violence, including domestic violence against women. Um, seeing the track record, predictably, of any law that gives discretion to enforcing authorities, that that discretion is predictably disproportionately used in ways that are not uh, hospitable to protecting women's safety. Or, or the safety of LGBTQ individuals, as I showed in the book, uh, and this continues to be true. In addition to singling out women and advocates of women's rights and reproductive freedom advocates, uh, all of the laws targeting sexual expression disproportionately target expression by and on behalf of sexual and gender minorities. Can I jump in here? Um, so uh, you may be partially answered it already in what you've just said, but um, was interested in the book in defending pornography. So you criticize Catherine McKinnon for using this no debate strategy against you. Um, and one of your criticisms in regard to that strategy was that it allowed her to present the feminist perspective on pornography. Um, and so you quote this New York Times reporter who said, Virtually all feminists agree that pornography is detrimental to women. And you write that statement is patently untrue, as this book demonstrates. So I think one thing I really wanted to get clear on was, in what sense do you see your defense of pornography uh, as free speech, as being a specifically feminist defense? Because you presumably agree that one could be an ardent defender of free speech and yet not a feminist. So what is it about your perspective that makes it kind of a feminist take specifically? And thank you so much for that excellent question, Holly. And I do want to underscore that I, of course, defend McKinnon's right not to engage in a debate with me. Uh, that is part of her um, strategic use of her free speech rights exactly to make a point, uh, which I think was was quite effective uh, up to uh, up to a, a, a limit, but um, uh, she did force the counter organization of specifically feminist organizations that oppose censorship. And what do I mean by specifically feminist? Um, getting beyond the traditional free speech based arguments, you know, that censoring pornography as defined by McKinnon and Horkin, which by the way, is sexually oriented expression that subordinates women or is demeaning or degrading uh, to or dehumanizing to women um, to uh, and to argue that that and this is how the courts that ruled on those laws didn't have to go beyond the First Amendment. They said that this violates what the Supreme Court has called the bedrock principle of free speech rights under the First Amendment, viewpoint neutrality or content neutrality. The government can't single out speech based on dislike of its viewpoint. Well, the law on its face was singling out 
sexual expression with a certain viewpoint, namely a viewpoint that women are subordinated. Um, those of us who are making feminist arguments as well, and this includes the ACLU Women's Rights Project in its brief, uh, opposing the mckinnon dworkin style law, it said not only do these laws violate the First Amendment freedom of speech, they also violate the 14th Amendment's equal protection guarantee. They undermine gender equality by um, being by reflecting and reinforcing gender-based stereotypes, including that women are inherently harmed by sexual expression um, and that men are inherently likely to be triggered to commit violence uh, against women or to have a negative attitude toward women by looking at sexual expression. Uh, there were other gender stereotypes that were reflected in the, uh, in the so-called radical feminist concept, including that sex itself is inherently um, something that is antithetical to women, to, to women. Even, uh, even lesbian sex, I, mean, I get, can get into more too many details at this point, but um, I would say the other major point that I think is a feminist point more than a free speech point is that if your goal, if the goal that you're focusing on is advancing women's equality, safety, and dignity, then these laws do more harm than good. So not even looking at the free speech harm, right? That it's suppressing certain thoughts and ideas and expressions, but that actually it is undermining women's equality and dignity. And one of the things that I'm very proud of uh, uh, at the time in the 1990s, when early 1990s, when these debates were raging in the United States, uh, Henry Louis Gates, uh, eminent African American studies and basically complete uh, uh, expert at Harvard, who was doing a lot of writing in the public general public sphere as well, wrote a very widely circulated essay in which he said that he credited the anti-pornography anti strain of the women's movement as being original. Uh, whereas he said, you know, the, the anti-pornography arguments are not original to this generation of feminists. Uh, there's been a long strain of feminism that's had some suspicion about sexual expression and seen it as damaging to women, but it is a new development to see a specifically feminist-based response to that perspective. Can I can I just <clears throat> try to clarify? So, this um, idea that porn subordinates women is that the crux of the disagreement? So, do you think that you could agree with the McKinnon Dawkins side? that porn does subordinate women, but still give a feminist argument for why we should allow that viewpoint? Or is it That's... that you, you disagree that porn subordinates women yeah. and then you think, okay, A, it's a false claim and B, trying to suppress that yeah. mode of expression does more yeah. harm than good. Yeah, both of the above. So oh, okay. I, I think I, I would never subscribe to a generalization that even any particular work uh, that we would agree is pornographic, right? Because it's describing or depicting sex. I, I would not agree that any such image is subordinating to women. I mean, take for example, the, the most horrific thing that I can think of. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I, the, the, the most horrific image that popped into my mind, uh, fortunately I have not seen the visuals, but I've read descriptions of the sexual violence that was committed by Hamas terrorists against young Israel women. My God, I can't imagine anything more horrific. Talk about subordinating, dehumanizing, degrading those words even seem to pale in comparison to the horror of what was done to these individuals. And yet I would not want to censor uh, news footage, you know, uh, graphic uh, depiction, capturing of that 
horribly subordinating, dehumanizing, degrading, torture uh, image, right? I guess one could say it's like a snuff film, right? Uh, showing a woman being killed. Uh, but do you, than... but sorry, I think it's confusing because there could be some examples where you deny, you could oh. say there's one porn video in the whole world that is not subordinating. Well, now, are you asking but... me that as a hypothetical? Because what I'm trying to do, Holly, is to say I can't Im imagine even the worst example of subordination that I can imagine, which I just described, to yeah. me, I would not say is inherently subordinated. And I'm sorry, I didn't finish my sentence, right? So one could say, that's if that's not subordinating, what is? And I would say, no, because it is showing a man who is trying to um, show and, and is carrying out his view that women are subordinated and don't deserve to be treated like human beings. But that, to me, does not result in degrading that woman. She's presumably, you know, a brave person uh, who did whatever she could to uh, withstand the attacker. And I would not describe her as having been subordinated. And I would certainly assume that the vast majority of people who look at it don't say, oh, that woman is subordinated, let alone that women are subordinated. No, it's a rallying cry for the inherent human dignity and rights of women and why we have to oppose ideologies such as those that fuel these Hamas terrorists and, and rapists. Okay, so but I that's, guess, and sorry, it's just confusing as an example because that's news of something that really yeah, happened. Okay. And um, well, if, someone made, if someone made a porn video with that Hamas type content and other people were masturbating to it, yeah, do you deny yeah. that that would be subordinating women? I, I cannot put such a, 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 I'm trying to use a neutral term here, such an, to me, over necessarily oversimplified conclusory label on it, Holly, I guess okay. because what I'm saying is each one of us views it subjectively. And to me, the, con the concept of whether something is subordinating is a judgment that's made uh, from the perspective of the viewer. I have no doubt that a Hamas viewer who would actually commit those acts himself is going to say it, yay, this is subordinating to the woman. But I don't see it as inherently subordinating. Um, to me, it just conveys any more than I would say that um, showing an image of other, let's say, non-sexualized violence is a is violent, right? In the sense, maybe we're disagreeing about what the terms mean. Uh, to me, when you say something, is the image subordinating? It's like, is it endorsing subordination? Is it leading the viewer to adopt uh, a perspective in favor of subordinating or, or violence? And to me, it could have exactly the opposite impact on, on the viewer. And that's, that's I think that the, to me, it's all inescapably subjective. And that's why I don't think you can look at the content alone to decide what label to affix to it. Um, I did, you know, from years ago, well, defending pornography is so old that in the early 1990s when I wrote it, I quoted Carol Vance, a very respected anthropology professor at Barnard, who uh, was one of the early students of pornography and opponents of um, censoring it. And she said, um, and let's see if I can paraphrase it, she called it Vance's one-third rule. And she said, show any image of, you know, pornography to a, even a group of like-minded feminist women. And one-third will say it's disgusting, one-third will say it turns me on, and one-third will say it's boring, uh, to underscore the inherent subjectivity. To further clarify, I mean, I think there's such an interesting question around the subordination uh, and around what counts as pornography. I mean, there's a sense in which, let's say, the footage that was taken by the Hamas terrorists is a document of rape as opposed to pornography designed to um, arouse people. And then there's the imitators of that who design something to arouse people. 
um, and we might think the one counts pornography and the other one not, even if it was hard to distinguish. Um, and then the subordination question is fascinating because you could, as you say, have the intent to subordinate on behalf of the the terrorist or the or the male actor. Um, you could have a feeling of subordination from the woman. You could be trying to send the signal that not just this woman, but all women are subordinate. But it might be that you're unsuccessful in that. As you say, like different viewers are going to read the material quite differently. So in the real case, people might look at that woman and say, you know, you've endured one of the worst possible things you know, you see the humanity in that. You see the sort of true dignity, the triumph of spirit in some way, even if it results in that person's ultimate death. Um, you also might think that in the fantasy realm of pornography, often what's happening is that there is playing the role of a subordinate um, as opposed yeah. to actually being subordinate. So that the performer doesn't feel subordinated at all in the way that an actor who gets killed on a set doesn't actually die. Um, and it's not clear that you could ever send that signal that all women you know, are lesser. Um, it seems like maybe the message trying to send is this woman is lesser in this role, in this fictional material. Um, but that's it's a very so, different kind so of It's all so interesting. And Holly, when you talked about the, well, the, this is news, I do want to point out that Catherine McKinnon, who was really one of the, in the United States, and I think worldwide, the one of the key leaders of the radical feminist uh, anti-pornography uh, position along with uh, Andrea Dworkin. Catherine McKinnon is a lawyer and law professor. Andrea Dworkin was a journalist. Uh, she died quite a few years ago now. Um, but they refused to make an exception for news uh, so that they said that the, the news footage or even descriptions of the rapes of the women in the Bosnian conflict, which were going on at the time, uh, that that was pornography and that should be punished as as pornography. Yeah, I guess I'm, um, yeah, I'm sort of reeling because I it's so familiar to me to think of, I mean, even outside of pornography, right, we're used to like analyzing media, for example. So like mm -hmm. advertisements for products where the, mm -hmm. the man is stepping on the throat of the woman or yeah. I just would have thought it's fairly, fairly obvious that there is subordinating imagery, even if there are idiosyncratic individuals who do not like, you know, you say it's subjective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. there are idiosyncratic takes on things, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't have thought that it's impossible across the board to say that an image yeah, whether it's a photo or a film or an artistic yeah. thing is subordinating. And so I'm just kind of trying to process what does that mean I, for... I, think I do think that we're using the words <laughs> differently because um, to me, and maybe it's the ING, the gerund, is the, fil is the depiction having a subordinating impact is the way that I'm processing that right but you're probably asking something and i'm saying well not necessarily because in fact there's actually quite a funny example that ironic example i use from defending pornography the anti-pornography women feminist anti-pornography organizations in the u.s um before social media their main tool of activism was to display holly exactly what they considered to be the most offensive degrading subordinating images and we right. were describing that to show was, people yeah what's going i was on. thinking i was thinking of the infamous woman in a meat grinder and they yep. were showing that it was on the cover or like hustler or something like that they were showing that on sidewalks in new york and uh women against pornography which is a big group in new york i uh, took out tables uh, not only on sidewalks but inside grand central station which is a major train station that commuters go through in new york and at the commuters uh complained to the government officials who run grand central station saying you know these are disgusting offensive subordinating images get them out of here they were right. kicked out of grand central station and they came to the new york civil liberties union and said please defend our right to show these subordinating degrading images of women to commuters right uh, and so that's the way i interpret it obviously not for a subordinating purpose but for exactly the opposite and by the way, you know, I want to make it very clear that, uh, and I, in my book, I do this expressly to commend and thank 
the anti-pornography movement for calling attention to the extent to which women are abused and subject to violence, including in the porn industry, as well as in the legal world and every other area uh, in which women have been engaged. So I completely agree with them about the, the problems. I just strongly disagree about what's an effective solution. So do you think that there's pornography that is uh, actively good, um, that not just we should protect, but that we I, should celebrate? You know, I'm not an expert on pornography. I defend it not because I'm a particular aficionado, just the way I defend freedom for hate speech or, you know, extremist speech, not because I, you know, am somebody who wants to consume them uh, myself. But for doing the research on, but I do know this, that, uh, many great works that I have enjoyed have been attacked as pornographic, you know, from uh, the Bible to great works of literature to our bodies, ourselves, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I, you know, I've looked at, I had a friend named Candida Royal, sadly she died a few years ago, who had been a porn star um, who became a producer of feminist-oriented pornography uh, with the greatest respect and affection to Candace. I'll say I, I just find the whole genre not particularly uh, interesting. I watched her stuff. I, um, uh, but I, I do think that there are many people clearly judging by audience um, uh, numbers that it's the most popular uh, a form of entertainment, right, for most people. Uh, and I, some of the statistics, I, I cite them in one of the additions to the book, um, that if you add up all of the revenues of theater and concert halls and movie theaters, uh, et cetera, et cetera, it's apparently dwarfed by the revenues that are raked in by the porn industry. So there just seems to be a boundless appetite. And I would say, you know, if people want it, there it must be doing something positive for them. And to pick up a point that you were making earlier, Mark, now we have these home porn videos where people are putting it or making it and putting it out there even without getting any revenue at all. I understand. They're doing it completely for free. They get pleasure from doing it. Um, presumably the professor we were talking about at the beginning of this show um, was in that category. Now, where I can see that it would be have an especially positive benefit, and this was something that, quite frankly, hadn't occurred to me until I did the research for defending pornography, and that was uh, for people who have a hard time having actual sexual relations with actual human beings for various reasons, including uh, physical or intellectual disabilities or shyness, um, or that they consider themselves to be unattractive. Um, these were examples where, you know, I saw many people say, thank goodness for pornography, it's my only sexual outlet or my major outlet for sexual satisfaction. Um, can I ask a question that sort of all, all goes between two of your books? So one one's defending pornography, but the other one is your hate speech book. Um, so first question is like, is this a fair way to understand you? And then I have a, another question if it is. So is it fair to understand you as giving lexical priority to liberty over equality? And that being the explanation of why you focus on free speech and refuse to limit hate speech, including hate speech against women or group defamation against women. Is that a fair assessment of what's going on in those two? No. Okay, please. It's not with this caveat, and I'll explain why, but thank you. I'd love to answer that question. Um, but what exactly do you mean by lexical? It's that, I've... that, that I'm thinking in, in, in any potential conflict or trade-off between liberty and equality, it's always liberty. No. Um, and I, I, okay, good. So absolutely not. And thank you so okay. much because that's, uh, that to me is the false, uh, charge that's made or the false premise that's asserted 
in favor of the so-called feminist anti-pornography law or in favor of the so-called anti-hate speech laws. And before I explain why that premise is false, uh, Holly, or actually it's part of the explanation, is that neither I nor, much more importantly, the United States Supreme Court takes the position that all hate speech, all pornography, all speech that arguably depicts uh, discriminatory or subordinating or hateful images is per se automatically categorically protected. No, it's not per se categorically unprotected because we despise its content. And I want to make clear, I could not, if somebody is a lifelong crusader for equal human rights, I could not despise hateful or discriminatory or stereotyping content more. Uh, But US law does, in my view, appropriately say, if in a particular context, that discriminatory, hateful, subordinating message directly causes certain specific serious imminent harm, then Mm -hmm. it can and should be punished. So, you know, that means that, um, and one can imagine hate speech and pornography satisfying uh, any number of examples that the Supreme Court has recognized of context-based limits on speech that are appropriate. For example, sexual harassment. And here I do give Catherine McKinnon, you know, great kudos because in addition to pioneering the concept of um, anti-feminist, anti-pornography law, which I disagree with, she did spearhead the concept of uh, uh, sexual harassment that is a violation of the 14th Amendment equal protection rights for women. And I think that was an enormous contribution. Uh, and can I just but can I just interject to make sure you're going in the direction yeah, that yeah, speaks yeah. to my yeah, my, yeah. my burning question? Because it sounds like you're saying what I want to know about is the sort of whether liberty is trumping equality. And it sounds like what you're saying is no, harm trumps both. If there's imminent harm that meets the incitement definition under US law, no, that's going to be the limit on no, yeah, liberty. No. But still, that could preserve the relation between liberty and equality. So. I, your question may be too sophisticated for me, but thank you for giving me the opportunity <laughs> to try to explain it. And then please, please ask a follow-up because okay. it's really stretching my brain in a positive way. Um, <laughs> both liberty and equality are equally fundamental rights under okay. the U.S. Constitution. And in my personal viewpoint, neither one nor the other is presumptively trumps the, you know, the other. One has to look in every situation. If the government is going to be restricting an equal protection right, it may only do so if the restriction is necessary to promote a countervailing goal of compelling importance and narrowly tailored to do that, no less restrictive alternative. But likewise, with respect to free speech. So neither one starts with an an added weight on the scale. And there are situations where the concern for equal protection is sufficient to justify a restriction on free speech. And one good example of that is sexual harassment law, that you should generally be allowed to make sexist comments. That's your free speech, right? But if restricting you from doing that is necessary, to preserve gender equality, for example, in the workplace or in an educational setting, then not only may the government, but the government should uh, outlaw sexual harassment. Now, you know, reasonable people could disagree about how we define it and whether particular expression is enough to satisfy that, that definition. But certainly as a matter of principle, at some point, the equality concern I wouldn't say it is enough to justify a limit on the liberty concern, but the opposite can be true as well. And, you know, I, I, in some head spinning situations, Holly, I've uh, actually analyzed these cases from 
the other perspective, you know, so let's start by looking at it from a free speech perspective. Let's start from looking at it from an equality perspective. And it, to me, the outcome is exactly the same uh, because it's, it's false to say, so for example, um, a hate speech restriction that allowed the, okay, let's, let's stay with pornography, which by the way, uh, as I think your question is implicitly saying, but I'd like to make it explicit, the feminist concept, the radical feminist concept of illegal pornography is a type of hate speech, right? It's um, yeah. a hate speech that consists of uh, sexual images or words that is hateful toward women. So it's right. not surprising that the same principles and, and arguments obtain in both situations. But if the government had power to suppress speech simply because it conveyed what some people deem to be a subordinating view of women, my analysis would show that not only does that not actually advance women's equality, but to the contrary, as we discussed earlier, it erodes women's equality. And so you're advancing neither one, you know, both liberty and equality would suffer if we gave no, the government that added power. No, that's extremely helpful. I think because I, this goes back to what we talked about earlier about the whether porn sub subordinates, because I accept the claim that pornography is essentially hate speech against women, the mm -hmm. only way I could figure out your um, giving such priority to speech was to think you must have this lexical relation. Like you must just think liberty trumps equality. And so that's the explanation. So what you just said about harassment is really helpful. You know, partly it's that you deny with the, you deny the empirical claim about pornography, but you think in principle, these, these two things can be balanced. Just, it's just that you don't think that there are the effects on the equality side that, that people like me or other radical feminists think that there are. So yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you. I'm so glad. And I, if I can, in um, my new book, what it's the first substantive chapter is the most important arguments for and against free speech. And because I really do want to challenge myself, I like, to the best of my, first of all, if I were convinced that an added restriction on hate speech or including pornography uh, was effective and mm -hmm. the least speech restrictive alternative for advancing women's safety or dignity or equality, I would be all in favor of it. And more to the okay. point, the United States Supreme Court would be all in favor of it. You know, and, and by the way, that's that thought experiment happened when Catherine McKinnon came up with her definition of sexual harassment. There were some people on the ACLU National Board who were absolutely opposed to um, making any, allowing government or employers uh, any latitude to punish any expression on that rationale. Uh, but, you know, I enthusiastically supported the vast majority of the board that said, no, in certain circumstances, if it, this is necessary for gender equality, uh, it's a warranted limitation on free speech. I won't even call it an exception to free speech, limitation on, on free speech. But so in my new book, um, I challenge myself with the most important arguments for and against free speech. And um, one of them, uh, number three, which I think is, you know, it's, it's one of the top three for sure. It might even be number one, but I have it here as number three. Doesn't First Amendment law wrongly privilege freedom of speech above equality rights. And my interpretation of the law um, is pr pretty much what I just said is my own view, uh, Holly, which is that it does not do so. Um, and I've got a whole subsection, I'd be happy to send you the, that answer, um, a subsection under that question, when may government restrict speech in order to promote equality, and I give a couple examples of that. Um, and um, why should, then another question is, why shouldn't government have even more power to restrict speech with the aim of advancing equality? 
and I go through the kind of analysis that I've done all here. Um, so, um, you know, we so, may disagree empirically about what the evidence shows. I think there is a, 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 a lot of debate about this, although I recently looked again at evidence about the connection between viewing pornography and committing, uh, having negative attitudes or committing negative actions. And again, there seems to be uh, an absence of evidence. So one of the features of pornography is that uh, it's quite egalitarian in terms of who gets to perform in it, in a way that, let's say, traditional Hollywood movies or beauty magazines aren't. So for a long time, it was quite rare to see, uh, let's say, a black woman on the cover of a beauty magazine. Um, whereas pornography is sort of catered for all of these interests in this kind of anarchic way. So you find people with disabilities, uh, people of different ages, people of different races, uh, different sexual orientations, different numbers. Uh, it seems like a format that really is egalitarian, that cares about you know, treating everyone equally in terms of being able to participate. Um, and then the marketplace kind of decides as to who generates an income from it. Um, and so that's an interesting way of seeing freedom and equality walk hand in hand. I will say that I can hear the ghost of Jason over my shoulder when he hears any talk <laughs> of rights. He says, well, it's exactly this sort of lawyerly line where lawyers go, no, freedom and equality um, you know, really can be merged and there's no trumping. He says, well, there clearly clashes. Um, there's clearly cases where you claim there's a right, which means that it always wins, and someone else says there's a right which always wins, um, but they're not getting into the same point. And so he says, all rights talk is bullshit. Um, we should be talking about um, pleasure and pain, and we just work out you know, how to get there. And maybe we pretend that there are rights to get there along the way. It depends what you mean as a right, because this goes to another, actually my question number one uh, in that list of what are the strongest counter arguments is, isn't the First Amendment law too absolute? And my answer is no, it's not absolute. And in fact, even under the U.S. Constitution and Bill of Rights, which I think is about the most libertarian in the world, right? No right is absolute, with only one exception. I like to tease my students by, by asking. Um, uh, the one exception is the 13th Amendment, which after the Civil War outlawed, absolutely outlawed slavery and involuntary servitude. Although in fairness, it had one specific exception, which is somebody who's been committed of a felony, very distressing. Uh, but basically it just says, you know, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist, period. All the other rights, even though we don't have the, I know that other constitutions and international and human rights, regional human rights treaties have express language that's, that it says exceptions can be made for national security, et cetera, et cetera. Even though we don't have that express exception, all of the rights have always been read as implicitly subject to limitation for, you know, in circumstances that are often called the emergency situation uh, when necessary to prevent dire harm to an important public interest. So if if you're if Jason means rights in the absolute sense, then I agree with him. It's a it's a misnomer. We could say their interests, but their interests that are presumptively protected and can only be overridden with an extraordinary showing. The burden of proof is on the government. But going back to Holly's question, it's the same burden of proof whether the right that's being violated is equality or free speech. Yeah, I think Jason would want to cash it out that way in a kind of John Stuart Mill sense of saying interests matter. Um, we can create various rules along the way. Um, but ultimately we're aiming for some kind of, you know, human good, um, and that the rights are maybe useful fictions. You know, the deontologists don't like that stuff. <laughs> they want to say, no, they really are these human rights and they are actually absolute. And, you know, you can't do these things ever regardless of the consequences. But I think legal systems really do take that largely consequentialist line and then they allow these exceptions along the way. Speaking of the, of the feminists, uh, another point that has become... Um, current, or I've started reading a lot about it, is giving Harriet Taylor 
uh, quite a lot of credit for having written Om Liberty, so I usually refer to her in the same breath. I don't know if you philosophical ex experts have any view on that, but algorithms algorithms have done studies that purport to show that she was a, a principal author. All I know is how contested that is. <laughs> I haven't like come down on the side where I'm confidently <laughs> proclaiming it. <laughs> so sure. I got super interested in your discussion of McKinnon's comment that, uh, and I'm going to quote her, the labor movement has its scabs, the slavery movement had its Uncle Tom's and Oreo cookies, and we have FACT, which is the Feminist Anti-Censorship Task Force, meaning feminists um, for pornography. So you take explicit issue in the Defending Pornography book with being classified as one of the quote unquote Uncle Toms of patriarchy. Um, and then as Leon Katz put it, uh, and you gave a rejoinder uh, through the voice of Marsha Pali, who says, among other things, how foolish to believe that Strawson, a professor at New York Law School, could think for herself or that her contributions uh, to various scholarly journals were anything but sad efforts to pass the litmus test of male colleagues. So that made me wonder, in the abstract, this kind of question of how someone who's in a viewpoint minority can possibly know when they're an Uncle Tom or not. <laughs> and then I've been sort of thinking about this for the last few days, um, particularly in respect to the idea that obviously there are incentives in place to tempt members of minority groups over to a particular side where they can be used as like shields against allegations of racism or sexism or whatever. So I guess I just wanted to put it to you. Like, do you have any thoughts about how these people in a position like you are or like Coleman Hughes or John McWhorter are for African-Americans or anyone that's like in the minority, but is a sort of intellectual dissident? How do you know when you're, yeah, just being heterodox and independent and how do you know when you're like taking those incentives of the dominant group that, that surely exists? You're not going to be surprised that I say this is such a subjective, a matter of subjective judgment. Uh, before I say more in response to that excellent provocative question, uh, I do want to um, pause on one phrase that you used, Holly, when you were referring to fact, of which I was an active member, it's disbanded now, Feminist yeah. Anti-Censorship Task Force, you referred to it as women for pornography. And we are, were no more for pornography than women who support uh, the right to abortion are for abortion. We defend the right of individuals to make their choices. As you know, I, in response to your earlier question that Mark raised, I'm fairly ignorant about pornography. So. Um, uh, it, but you raise a really excellent question, and I was thinking of um, John McWhorter too, because um, unfortunately, that epithet has been used in to such an extent that. It's almost hard for me to to cite his, re to me, really persuasive writings because I know some people are just going to dismiss it. Mm -hmm. By the way, I was also thinking that Uncle Tom may not have been an Uncle Tom. Hate to complicate this, but I actually read the book for the first time fairly recently. I confess I had never read it. It wasn't required reading when I was growing up as a kid. And, you know, it was a few years ago now, but I was amazed because I had this stereotype just from what the term is, mm -hmm. but it wasn't necessarily connected to the book because in the book, to me, he doesn't come across as some servile, you know, self-deprecating, slavish, uh, kind of person, but somebody who had an amazing amount of dignity and was doing a great deal of good uh, for other enslaved individuals. I was astounded. I, I made this point to a friend of mine who's actually uh, a historian and an expert and said, yeah, no, Uncle Tom was Uncle Tom. So <laughs> we or at least that is subject to debate, that there are different perspectives, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think what this shows is that those of us, you know, maybe it's not true for you philosophers, you may just deal 
in the realm of ideas. I say that with the greatest respect, but the greatest ignorance of what philosophers actually do. Uh, but for somebody like me who's toiling in the policy trenches, uh, I'm always very uh, uh, concerned by about by strategic considerations. And so, you know, even if I have a right to say something, or if I think a point is theoretically correct and justifiable, I'm not necessarily going to exercise my right. That's where I think I, I disagree, going back to the thought experiment at the very beginning, even though I think I would have had a right to do what that um, provost did, I would exercise my judgment not to do it as a strategy matter, not because I don't think I have a right to do it, but he shouldn't be condemned for making a different judgment to go back to that. Um, so here too, I think that one has to be very concerned about how one's arguments can be used. I have to deal with this all the time in the United States today, Holly, when so many of the people who are arguing in favor of free speech principles are conservatives uh, and even right-wingers, uh, perhaps even uh, racial white supremacists. And so one has to, and this is a question that was raised for the ACLU way back in the 1970s when we famously defended free speech for Nazis in Skokie. You know, many members of our own organization said, you know, that not that they disagreed in principle, although some of them may have, but I think the bigger disagreement was as a matter of strategy. Is that a wise use of organizational resources? Are you going to do more good for these racists um, than you're doing for free speech in general? To me, that was, you know, that was a clearly correct decision. And I do reach the same conclusion with respect to my advocacy of free speech for um, pornography, hate speech, even though no doubt some people who will take advantage of it are the people who take advantage of every form of protected free speech, whether it be defamation, disinformation, you know, any kind of uh, you know, political speech are, are, are abusing it. The right to political speech, I think, has led to just ugly, ugly vulgarities on the part of so many uh, politicians and the right of people to voice views about the Middle Eastern conflict on campus has led to, I think, clearly advocacy of genocide, um, hate speech against Jews, hate speech against Muslims. Um, it, but I still think that the net uh, and I'll, let me say, at first I was going to say that there is a net positive for all the causes I care about, including re reducing hatred. Uh, but actually, I think the more modest and accurate way to put it is I think there is even more danger to the causes I espouse by giving more power to the censors. So mm -hmm. ultimately, I think it's, you know, anti of whatever Arvold Tom stands for.